section seven of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter seven during the absence of the emperor aurangzeb in the south of india whither he had gone to make war on tana shah king of golconda there arose great administrative irregularities at that time mian khan was viceroy of jammu he sent his commander-in-chief alif khan to levy tribute on kripal raja of kangra gasari chand raja of jaswal prithi chand raja of dadwal sukh dev raja of jasrat and others alif khan first addressed himself to raja kripal either pay me suitable tribute or contend with me in arms kripal made him certain presents and then told him that raja bim chand of bilaspur was the greatest of all the allied hill chiefs were he first to pay tribute all the rest would follow his example and then there would be no necessity for warfare if however bim chand were to refuse and elect the alternative of war kripal would still support alif khan raja dayal the chief of bijarwal probably persuaded by raja kripal also promised to meet alif khan's demands alif khan adopted raja kripal's suggestion and proceeded towards bilaspur raja bim chand's capital halting at nadan he sent an envoy to bim chand with the same demand as he had previously made kripal bim chand replied that he would rather defend himself than pay tribute having dispatched this message he called his principal officials to a council of war his prime minister thus advised him if thou desire victory it shall be assured on condition that thou obtain the guru's assistance this advice pleased bim chand and he accordingly sent the prime minister to the guru to request his active support the guru pondered on the proposal and accepted it for the following reasons the friendship between himself and raja bim chand was duly ratified and it would be a shame to him if by his refusal to render assistance his friend were defeated secondly bim chand's prime minister had put himself under the guru's protection as a suppliant and the guru felt that he could not refuse his prayer he accordingly sent raja bim chand the following message i shall be with thee early on the morrow pay no tribute to the turks if thou pay it to-day there will be another demand on thee to-morrow but if thou fight and cause the turks to retreat then shall no one molest thee raja bim chand on receiving this promise made certain of his victory raja kesari chand raja prithi chand and raja sukh dev took their forces to join his and all proceeded to nadan to give battle to alif khan raja kripal and raja dayal's troops these were encamped on an eminence and had therefore superiority of position bim chand ineffectually essayed to take them by surprise but the arrows and bullets which his troops discharged only struck rocks and trees and inflicted no loss on the enemy bim chand much disheartened invoked with all fervour hanuman the monkey god who had assisted ram chandar in his expedition against ceylon and called on his allies to join him in another charge this was met by raja kripal and raja dayal's forces who slew all the men that succeeded in scaling the eminence bim chand had now almost lost all hope when the minister reminded him that the guru's troops had not yet entered the field the guru receiving bim chand's summons mounted his steed and at once proceeded to his assistance 
bim chand after greeting the guru requested him who was senior as well by virtue of his spiritual rank as by the bravery of his troops to storm the enemy's position the guru and his troops discharged fatal arrows rushed the stockades and created dismay in the ranks of the enemy alif khan raja kripal and raja dayal now thought it time to leave their fastnesses and come forth to confront bim chand and the guru their main attack was directed against bim chand whom they caused to retreat prithi chand endeavoured to restrain bim chand's retreating forces and single-handed with drawn sword set himself to oppose alif khan and dayal's onset so completely did he succeed that alif khan and his allies troops turned to flee raja dayal was enraged at seeing his troops retreating and began to ply his arrows with such fatal effect on his opponents that bim chand's troops again wavered upon this bim chand again addressed himself to the guru o guru seest thou not that this brave man is destroying our army if i am defeated thou shalt have the odium thereof the guru at once turned his steed round and challenged raja dayal if thou mean to strike then deal the first blow say not hereafter that the guru hath struck thee unawares this enraged dayal who at once made a desperate effort to kill the guru the guru seeing this took steady aim with his musket and lodged a bullet in dayal's breast dayal fell like a tree blown down by the wind niraja kripal saw his brave ally fallen he knew that his cause was lost he however put himself in the van and made a desperate effort to retrieve the disaster the guru now in full martial temper incessantly discharged arrows which took deadly effect on the enemy the survivors again fled to their fastnesses upon this alif khan and kripal held a council of war they both accepted the fact that they had been defeated owing to the assistance given bim chand by the guru and they resolved to escape at night in this they succeeded when the allied army next morning found the ground unoccupied they were profuse in their praises and acknowledgments to the guru the guru in order to take rest and enjoy retirement and contemplation remained for eight days after the battle on the pleasant and picturesque banks of the river bias raja kripal proposed a reconciliation with raja bim chand which after some negotiations was duly effected the guru on hearing this was greatly pleased he decided on a speedy return to anandpur and caused his drum to be beaten as the signal for his departure his party arrived at alsan on their way the inhabitants having heard of raja bim chand's secret ill-will to the guru refused to sell his troops supplies on this the guru owing to the necessity of travel was compelled to order that supplies be forcibly taken after payment at current rates when the guru approached anandpur he caused his drum to be beaten the inhabitants on hearing the once familiar sound joyously came forth to receive him the guru's wife jito presented him with a son on the seventh day of the month of chet sambat seventeen forty seven the boy was called zorawar singh or the powerful lion to commemorate the battle of nadan when it became known that the sikhs had taken supplies forcibly at alsun some of the hill chiefs feared that the guru would some day seize their territories also others were of a contrary opinion and remained steadfast in their friendship for him some of the inhabitants of anandpur who wavered in their loyalty left the city lest they might suffer in any attack made on it by the guru's enemies in this movement however they were far from successful branded with infamy they could obtain no place of rest elsewhere and were glad to return and sue for the guru's pardon 
one dilawar khan who had attained power in the punjab during the insurrections which arose while aurangzeb was employed in the dakhan became jealous of the guru's fame and success and sent his son with a force of one thousand men to exact tribute from him if he refused then anandpur was to be sacked when this was accomplished dilawar's son was to take tribute in a similar manner from all the hill rajas the son hastened to obey the paternal command when he reached the bank of the satluj one of the guru's scouts hastened to give information of the approach of a hostile force the guru was roused from his sleep at night to receive this intelligence and make hasty preparations for defence the guru immediately ordered the drum to be beaten as the signal for his troops to take arms his men fell into line almost immediately and marched to the satluj on their arrival they startled the enemy by peals of artillery and thus gave an exaggerated idea of their numbers dilawar khan's son seeing that his men were suffering from the cold and unable to hold their weapons yielded to the representations of his officers to beat a retreat on their return march they plundered the town of barwa after that they marched to balan where they halted for two days and lived on the plunder of the village they thence returned to dilawar khan the son through shame durst not reply to his father when he censured him for his cowardice and the failure of his expedition dilawar khan had a slave called Hussein, who boasted that if his master gave him an army he would plunder the guru's city anandpur exact tribute from raja bhim chand and return home either with tribute or the heads of the recusant hill chiefs to effect these various objects dilawar khan gave him command of two thousand men with whom he promptly marched to anandpur the guru kept his troops in readiness to oppose the muhammadans meanwhile the latter were plundering the towns and villages through which they marched they also attacked and were victorious over the rajah of dadwal seeing this and also the strength of hussein's army the faithless raja bhim chand broke his treaty with the guru and threw in his lot with his enemies bhim chand following the example of raja kripal of kangra paid tribute to hussein and in company with other traitorous chiefs proceeded with him to sack and destroy anandpur on hearing this the guru's mother diwan nan chand the guru's three surviving cousins and the masands all waited on the guru his mother said the brave hussein with a large army will soon be upon us and thou hast not yet prepared for battle my son depute some masand to go and make peace with him the guru replied mother dear be not in haste i am only doing the work which the immortal god assigned me the same immortal god will not allow him whom thou counsellest me to fear to approach me he shall perish before he reacheth anandpur when hussein was on his way to anandpur raja gopal of guler sent an envoy to say that he desired to meet him hussein replied that he would be glad to see gopal if he gave him a subsidy as raja bhim chand and kripal had done raja gopal went with raja ram singh to meet him gopal took some money with him and went and sat in council with bhim chand and the other hill chiefs who were in hussein's camp hussein was not pleased with gopal's contribution and told him to go home and bring as much again gopal set out for the purpose on his homeward way he changed his mind and decided that it would be more profitable to fight with hussein than give him more money he accordingly sent a messenger to inform him of his determination when hussein received this message he changed his objective from anandpur to guler to do battle with gopal he vowed that he would first destroy gopal's city and then march on anandpur in pursuance of his vow hussein proceeded to guler and invested it 
the citizens were soon reduced to great straits and the army asked permission to force their way out and contend with the mohammedans in the open field raja gopal replied have patience i will at once send an envoy to make peace with hussein hussein's terms were the payment of ten thousand rupees otherwise he would put gopal and his troops to death and destroy their fortress gopal unable to accept the terms sent an envoy to the guru to pray him to negotiate the desired peace with hussein the guru accordingly sent his agent sangatia with an escort of seven troopers and orders to conclude such a peace between the combatants as would be advantageous to gopal sangatia first took counsel with bim chand and kripal bim chand said o sikh we have been waiting for thee we advise thee to send for raja gopal at once and effect a reconciliation between him and hussein in pursuance of this object sangatia who knew that bim chand and kripal were on hussein's side took an oath from them that if he could succeed in bringing gopal to them for the purpose of arranging peace they would not molest him sangatia then went to gopal and stated all the circumstances he promised gopal that the guru would conduct him to bim chand and kripal who were with hussein and again take him back in safety to his fort sangatia added that if hussein did not agree to peace but accepted the fate of battle gopal should by the guru's favour be victorious when gopal reached the allied chiefs bim chand told him that if he paid the tribute demanded all would be well gopal still refused to pay the money and said hussein might do as he pleased upon this kripal plotted with bim chand to arrest him and make him over to hussein gopal who heard their intention contrived to elude them and having retired to the protection of his army sent a message of defiance to his enemies on one side were ranged hussein raja bim chand of bilaspur and raja kripal of kangra on the other were raja gopal of guler and raja ram singh a powerful chief who was in alliance with him the fight began with indescribable vehemence the guru's envoy sangatia and his seven sikhs were slain hussein having fought with great bravery perished on the battlefield raja kripal of kangra was slain himat and kimat two of hussein's officers were also slain on seeing this bim chand fled with his army gopal then went with large offerings to the guru and thanked him for his support and his prayers for the victory some masands escaped to the neighbouring hills and proclaimed themselves gurus in this they had a twofold object the emperor aurangzeb sent his son muazim afterwards known as bahadur shah into the punjab to collect tribute and the masands feared that they should have to part with their wealth both to the emperor and the guru it does not appear that the emperor's son remained long in the punjab or committed any depredations there he was succeeded by general mirza beg who peremptorily demanded tribute from the hill chiefs they represented that the masands who had settled in their territories were in possession of great wealth of which they had plundered the guru and his sikhs and which they might be called upon to disgorge mirza beg proceeded against them stripped them of all they possessed and subjected them to exquisite tortures any that escaped from him were afterwards punished by four other equally relentless officers who succeeded him a third son jujhar singh was now born to the guru on sunday the first day of the second half of the month of magh sambat seventeen fifty three a d sixteen ninety seven this was his wife jito's second son among those who went to the guru to congratulate him on the birth of his son were many bards sanyasis udasis and bairagis who had often listened to the guru's conversation at that time too came a bard called kuwar son of a famous poet called kisho das of bandel khand aurangzeb had tried to convert kuwar forcibly to islam upon which he fled for protection to the guru 
he presented a very humble metrical petition which the guru was pleased to accept the guru took him into his service on a liberal salary and in a similar way welcomed all bards who came to him for employment the practice of arms was never lost sight of at the guru's court even his eldest son ajit singh though now only ten years of age was duly instructed in the use of offensive and defensive weapons the guru used to take zorawar singh in his lap while he watched ajit singh fencing jujar singh too used to be brought by his nurse to witness the performance and imbibe from infancy a love for martial exercises the guru used often to inform his children of what the country had suffered from the turks so it behooved them to learn how to protect themselves and their sikhs jito in due time gave birth to a third son fatah singh who was born on wednesday the eleventh day of phagan sambat seventeen fifty five a d sixteen ninety nine this was the guru's fourth son in all end of chapter seven section eight of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain the life of guru gobind singh chapter eight one day the sikhs asked a pandit who used to read epic poems to the guru are the deeds attributed to bim arjan and others real or exaggerated the pandit thus addressed actuated by greed decided to mislead his questioners and replied bim arjan and the rest were really as powerful as they are described to have been this was result of their sacrifices and burnt offerings in honour of durga which made her visible to them the sikhs then prayed the pandit to show them how they could behold the goddess and vanquish their enemies the pandit on hearing this inwardly rejoiced that the sikhs had at last fallen into his power and what he deemed more important that he had found an opportunity of making a competence for himself he replied although no god or goddess becometh visible in this cow age yet such a manifestation may be possible by a due expenditure of money and by the performance of certain acts of devotion were the goddess durga to appear she would fulfil all your desires but a great feast must first be celebrated and a trial made as to who are the most holy brahmans so that they may perform sacrifice and burnt offerings with the object of ensuring the appearance of the goddess the sikhs informed the guru of this conversation he said to the pandit your statement that the goddess becometh not manifest in the kal age is not supported by proof if she appeared in the past ages why should she not also in this and if she appear not in this age then it is unlikely that she appeared in any former age at the same time i require not her blessings or curses i am son of the immortal who is the king of gods and men who controlleth millions of worlds who is omnipotent who cherisheth me and i have no need to adore gods or goddesses the pandit again represented that if the sikhs made durga manifest they should be successful in all their battles as durga herself had been in all her contests with the demons who had made war on the benign deities the guru being thus importuned determined to demonstrate the hypocrisy of the brahmans he invited them all to a great feast every form of viands including meat was provided for the guests when they were assembled he made it known that he would give five gold muhars to each brahman who ate meat while to each of those who ate food cooked with clarified butter he would give five rupees to eat meat is really forbidden to all brahmans yet several of them did so induced by the promised reward 
according to one account fourteen and according to another twenty-one brahmins refused the meat offered them the guru went to the brahmins who had eaten it and rebuked them saying you are setting a bad example to your people you are not brahmins but ghouls it is to deceive men you wear the tilaks on your foreheads and pretend you are high priests of religion but in reality you are merely chandals the lowest class of pariahs the guru however gave them the promised reward on that occasion the guru quoted the following words of kabir kabir where there is divine knowledge there is virtue and where there is falsehood there is sin where there is covetousness there is death where there is forgiveness there is god himself the guru also quoted the following slok of guru amar das as far as possible rely not on the covetous at the last moment they will plant thee where nobody will lend thee a hand the brahmans who abstained from meat pressed the pandit's suggestion on the guru if thou by worship and austerities can behold durga who is the living burning light of this age she will grant thee any boon thou mayest desire the guru inquired can you render durga manifest what you propose is not according to my religion the brahmans replied that there was a brahmin called kesho at banaras who had power to render the goddess manifest but he would demand large remuneration the guru again asked how a man filled with greed such as they represented kesho to be could possess such spiritual power as to cause durga to appear the brahmans unable to answer this question took their departure the guru utilized the assemblage at the hindu festival of the holy to organize on the following day a mimic warfare which he called mahala for the exercise of his troops the object of the guru has in recent times been obtained by the camps of exercise yearly established by the indian government kesho who was exceedingly avaricious heard that the guru was very open-handed and accordingly went to him he said he was on his way to behold the goddess of jawalamukhi but had halted to see the guru whose greatness was universally recognized he told the guru that he had power to render the goddess manifest but the ceremonies and burnt offerings which would have to be performed as a preliminary would be very expensive kesho was supported by the other brahmans who again pressed the guru to have the necessary ceremonies and burnt offerings performed the guru in order to demonstrate kesho's insincerity outwardly accepted his offer the brahman on ascertaining the guru's wealth was highly pleased and promised all assistance he made out a list of materials for a ham or burnt offering which would cost a large sum of money the guru provided what was required and asked where the ham was to be performed the brahman replied that it must be performed in a lonely spot the guru pointed to the beautiful hill of naina devi as a place where all ceremonies could be performed privately and without interruption the brahman was much pleased praised the guru's judgment and liberality and said that the goddess would certainly appear at the place indicated the guru then ordered the ground to be cleared after which the brahman proceeded to perform the ceremonies necessary for the goddess's manifestation one day the guru went out shooting and killed several forest birds on his return kesho told him the goddess would never appear to any one who took life the guru replied that animals were continually sacrificed to the brahman's goddess at jawalamukhi he then ordered his servant to let go the birds when the strings with which they had been fastened to the guru's saddle were undone it is said the birds flew away kesho was astonished and expressed himself happy at having been brought in contact with such a holy man as the guru 
the guru had many strange presents made him one day a gardener presented himself he had come all the way from patna with a young mango tree as an offering the gardener narrated how he had planted a garden and vowed in the hope of success to give the first tree it produced to the guru he now brought the tree and asked the guru where he would have it planted the guru said he would shoot an arrow and where it fell the tree might be planted the guru's arrow fell far distant and there the young tree was duly planted after nine months worship and invocation of the goddess the pandit told the guru that she would soon appear there would be many indications of such a result a disastrous earthquake would occur there would be unusual lightnings and several other formidable portents would appear in the heavens the guru pressed the brahman to fix a date for the goddess's appearance the brahman fixed the first day of the naratar a festival in honour of durga held in the month of asu and chet for the phenomenon the first day of chet passed and she did not appear the brahman then said she would appear on the fifth of the naratar the fifth day passed and she did not appear the brahman then said that some holy person must be offered as a sacrifice to her and she would afterwards undoubtedly disclose herself the guru replied who so worthy to be offered as a sacrifice as thou thou sayest there are none so holy as brahmans the pandit on hearing this began to suspect that the guru meant to sacrifice him to the goddess and if this occurred what a sad recompense it would be for all his labours he then said if thou give me permission i will go and fetch a human sacrifice the guru replied no the sacrifice is here on this the pandit's courage oozed forth from the partitions of his brain he immediately left the guru's presence on the pretext of performing an office of nature and never paused in his flight until he had arrived at a safe retreat after kesho had thus absconded the guru ordered that the materials which had been collected for the ceremony should be thrown into the ham pit upon this a great flame shot up towards the heavens when this was seen from afar all the spectators felt certain that the guru himself had caused durga to appear the guru drew his sword and set out for anandpur when the people asked if the goddess had appeared to him he raised his sword aloft inasmuch as to say that by god's assistance his sword would perform the deeds which the brahmans attributed to durga the people then erroneously believed that the goddess had given him the sword the baisakhi festival was now approaching the guru gave a great feast to which he invited all who were assembled in anandpur but omitted the brahman kesho he however sent for him when all the guests had partaken of the feast kesho angrily refused the invitation and said he would not eat the leavings of a low-caste rabble diwan nan chand on behalf of the guru recalled to kesho's memory the fact that he had like a coward deserted him fine service thou didst perform for him and thine anger and disappointment are the result kesho on further reflection went to the guru but at the same time refused to eat the remains of the feast the guru composed the following on this occasion whatever god wrote in thy destiny thou hast obtained o brahman banish thy regret it is not my fault that it escaped my memory think not of anger i shall send thee clothes and bedding to-day be thoroughly assured of this kesho replied all katris are made by the brahmans the guru look on my sikhs here with a glance of favour here the guru began to laud his sikhs and acknowledge the powerful assistance he had received from them my victories in battle have been through their favour through their favour i have already made gifts through their favour all my troubles have been removed through their favour again my house is replenished through their favours i have acquired knowledge through their kindness all my enemies have been killed through their favour i am exalted otherwise there are millions of ordinary men like myself 
to serve them pleaseth my heart no other service is dear to my soul to bestow gifts on them is well to make gifts to others is not profitable for my sikhs to bestow upon them will bear fruit in the next world and will bring honour even in this to bestow on others is altogether useless all the wealth of my house with my soul and body is for them the brahman became angry and his heart began to fry and burn like dry grass he wept at the custom which had been established for the future some writers are of opinion that the guru during the time the chroniclers state he was occupied in worshipping durga was in reality translating sanskrit works in the seclusion and tranquillity of the mountain glades these events occurred in sambat seventeen fifty five a d sixteen ninety eight and it was on the fourteenth day of june of that year the guru according to his own statement completed his translation of the ram avatar from sanskrit into hindi he adds that it was completed at the base of the lofty naina devi on the margin of the satluj waters End of chapter eight Section 9 of Sikh Religion, Volume 5, by Max Arthur McAuliffe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Life of Guru Gobind Singh, Chapter 9 We have now arrived at a very critical stage of our biography of the Guru, and it is necessary to set forth with clearness and certainty what the Guru really thought of idolatry or the worship of inanimate objects on this subject the best evidence obtainable is the guru's own acknowledged compositions in the akal ustad he writes as follows some worshipping stones put them on their heads some suspend lingams from their necks some see god in the south some bow their heads to the west some fools worship idols others busy themselves with worshipping the dead the whole world entangled in false ceremonies hath not found god's secret again in the same composition the guru addressing an idolater wrote as follows o great beast thou recognizest not him whose glory filleth the three worlds instead of the supreme god thou worshippest things the touch of which shall cause thee to lose heaven by way of doing good acts thou committest sin at which even the greatest sins are abashed fall at the feet of the supreme being o fool he is not in a stone in the vichitar natak are found the following among other similar verses i am not a worshipper of stones nor am i satisfied with any religious garb in the thirty-three sawayas the guru expresses himself as follows some fasten an idol firmly to their breasts some say that shiv is god some say that god is in the temple of the hindus others believe that he is in the mosque of the mussulmans some say that ram is god some say krishan some in their hearts accept the incarnations as god but i have forgotten all vain religion and know in my heart that the creator is the only god why worship a stone god is not in a stone worship him as god by the worship of whom all thy sins shall be erased and by taking whose name thou shalt be freed from all thy mental and bodily entanglements make the meditation of god ever thy rule of action no advantage can be obtained by the practice of false religion again the guru writes as follows in his celebrated letter to the emperor aurangzeb i am the destroyer of the turbulent hillmen since they are idolaters and i am a breaker of idols in further evidence of the guru's sentiments on the subject of idolatry we have a composition either written or sanctioned by himself which is found in his collected works on which to base our conclusion 
there was a king called samat san married to a lady called samarmati they had four sons and an only daughter called rankumb kala the children were put under the tuition of a brahman one day the princess went earlier than usual to the brahman's house and found him worshipping and prostrating himself before a salagram and a lingam she smiled on seeing her tutor thus engaged and asked him the reason of his extraordinary conduct the brahman this salagram o lady is a god whom great kings adore what dost thou who art ignorant know about it thou deemest this salagram which is god to be a stone the princess o great fool thou recognizest not him whose glory filleth the three worlds thou worshippest this stone at whose touch man's future bliss is forfeited thou committest sin to attain thine own object such sin as other sins would be aghast at o beast fall at the feet of the great god he is not a stone he liveth in the water in the dry land in all things and in all monarchs he is in the sun in the moon in the sky wherever thou lookest thou mayest fix thy gaze on him he is in fire in wind and beneath the earth in what place is he not he is contained in everything were all the continents to become paper and the seven seas ink were all the vegetables to be cut down and employed as pens were saraswati the goddess of eloquence to dictate and all beings to write for sixty ages they could not in any way describe god yet o fool thou supposest him to be a stone o man thou findest not god's secret thou deceivest the world in every way and fillest thy coffers with wealth as the reward of thy deception thou art thyself called by the world a clever and wise pundit but thou worshippest a stone and therefore thou appearest to me to have abdicated thy reason while uttering sheave sheave with thy mouth thy heart is filled with greed thou practisest excessive hypocrisy before the world and art not ashamed to beg from door to door thou remainest for nearly two hours holding thy nose as if thou wert practising jog thou standest on one leg invoking shiv if any one pass by and give thee one paisa thou pickest it up with thy teeth and forgettest thy gods thou givest instruction to others but meditatest not on god thyself thou ever preachest to people to despise money yet for that very money thou beggest at the doors of high and low and art not ashamed to debase thyself before even the meanest of thy fellow-creatures thou sayest that thou art holy but thou art very unholy thou callest thyself contented but thou art very discontented and only leavest one door to go and beg at another thou makest a clay idol of shiv and having worshipped it throwest it into the river when thou returnest home thou settest up another in its place thou fallest at its feet and rubbest thy forehead on the ground for an hour think what it hath to give thee thou worshippest the symbol of procreation and fallest before it believing it to be sheave thou callest a stone god but it will not avail thee since the stone belongeth to the lowest order of creation say what shall it give thee even if propitiated and pleased with thee even if it at any time make thee like itself thou shalt be no better than a stone great simpleton be assured that when thy life hath departed it will be too late for thee to know anything of god thou hast passed thy childhood without prayer but even in thy manhood thou hast not repeated god's name thou hast induced others to give charity but never lifted thy hand to assist another thou hast bent thy head to stones but never to god o oh, fool entangled in thy domestic affairs thy life thou hast passed in procrastination 
having read one or two purans o brahman thou art swollen with conceit thou hast not read the puran through which all the sins of this life may be erased it is for the sake of show thou practisest penance day and night thy mind is absorbed in lucre fools accept thy statements but not i why practisest thou so much hypocrisy for what object adorest thou a stone thou hast forfeited thy happiness here and hereafter thou givest false instruction and gladly acceptest all payment which thou claimest it is enough that thou hast given evil instruction to my brothers instruct not me the brahman hear me o princess thou hast not considered shiv's greatness ever worship the gods brahma vishnu and shiv thou knowest not their greatness and that is why thou talkest in that way know that they are the oldest of all the gods and do thou recognize them as the lords of the world i am o princess a fasting brahman and love all both high and low i communicate instruction to all and induce even great misers to practise charity the princess thou communicatest spells in order to make disciples thou then takest money as offerings from them in whatever way thou canst but thou teachest them not the truth and marrest their happiness in this world and the next hear o brahman thou plunderest in whatever way thou canst those to whom thou givest thine initiatory spell the fools receive no divine knowledge from thee but are fleeced for their pains thou tellest them that thy spell shall be advantageous to them and that she will grant them a boon when the spells turn out unsuccessful thou pretendest that they have omitted some necessary ceremony and that is why they have not been successful thou next tellest them to give alms to brahmans and perform the spell by which they might behold the god thou takest a fine from them when they ought to take it from thee for misleading them and in return for their money thou givest them the same spell over again thou leadest them astray all along the line and at last thou tellest them that they have omitted certain words or that something interrupted the ceremonies to account for the non-appearance of the god and his failure to grant the desired blessing on this thou counsellest them to again give thee alms o oh, brahman that is the sort of spell thou teachest those whose houses thou designest to plunder and when thy victims become poor thou goest to spy out others were thine incantations and spells efficacious thou wouldst sit as a monarch at home and not go about begging the brahman filled with anger and heaping curses on the princess said how canst thou know mine affairs thou talkest as if thou hadst taken bound the princess here o brahman it is thou who knowest not what thou sayest thou addressest me in an insolent manner my senses are not stolen away by bang whither have thine own senses gone without it thou callest thyself wise and that thou never takest bang even by mistake but when thou goest a begging thou insultest as if under the influence of bang him whose house thou visitest why beg from door to door for the money thou pretendest to despise thou goest to rajas and takest morsels from them thou sayest thou hast abandoned all worldly things and preachest to everybody to do the same why stretchest thou forth thy hand to grasp what thou pretendest to renounce to one man thou preachest to renounce wealth to another thou sayest that he is under the influence of malignant stars and therefore he ought to pay thee for deliverance therefrom it is in the hope of cheating people thou wanderest from door to door thou recitest the vades the shastars and the symmetries so that a double paisa may fall to thee from some one 
thou praisest him who givest thee anything and revilest him who refuseth in this way thou hopest to obtain alms from all people but thou reflectest not that praise and blame are every one's lot while alive but affect not the dead thou canst not confer salvation on those who give thee alms nor canst thou kill the son or father of him who giveth thee none i only accept him as a brahman who deemeth the givers and the refusers praise and blame as the same o brahman the man from whom thou extortest money or whom thou pleasest with thy varied flatteries shall at last go to hell in thy company brahmans though they say they have abandoned the world are lovers of wealth and in quest of it go to die either in banaras or kuman some through greed for money twist their matted hair round their heads others put on a wooden necklace and go forth shamelessly to the forest others again taking tweezers pluck out all the hair of their heads the brahmins practise hypocrisy in order to plunder the world and they thus lose their happiness both here and hereafter they make a clay lingam and worship it but it hath no power for good or evil why do men who know that the lingam hath no light in it light a lamp before it and why do very foolish and obstinate persons thinking it god fall down before it thoughtless one think of god and quickly cast away thy mind's indecision they who have studied for a long time in benares go at last to die in bhutan having acquired a little learning thou leavest thy home and wanderest from country to country thy father and mother thou hast left somewhere thy wife thy son and thy son's wife cannot find thee no one hath passed beyond the goal of covetousness it hath beguiled all people thou shavest the heads of some on others thou imposest fines and on others again thou puttest wooden necklaces to one thou teachest spoken to another written and to a third other forms of incantations yet thou conferrest no abiding spiritual knowledge some thou showest how to argue on learned subjects but to all thou settest an example of covetousness in thine efforts to obtain wealth to the best of thine ability thou showest no mercy and never propitiatest god o fool but worshippest clay it is on this account thou art doomed to wander begging think thoughtless one on him who made men conscious why deemest thou him unconscious why call a stone god why sellest thou thy precious soul under its value thou knowest nothing great simpleton and yet thou callest thyself a superior pandit diest thou not of shame o great boaster in thy pride thou forfeitest thine honour thou callest thyself a prophet and pretendest to know the future but yet thou knowest not even the past thou thinkest thyself very handsome and able and claimest to be continent and physically strong thou sayest that sheev is certainly in the stone but o oh, great fool thou knowest nothing o oh, clever man consider in what part of the stone parbati's lord is say what spiritual perfection thou attainest by bowing thy head to clay he whom the world cannot please will not be pleased by thy offerings of rice thou burnest incense blowest shells and rainest a shower of flowers thou growest weary in thine endeavours but findest not god in a stone to those who accept not thine incantations and spells thou recitest songs and verses in broad daylight thou stealest wealth from men's houses thieves pickpockets and robbers seeing thy cleverness are ashamed of their ignorance thou payest no heed to the magistrate or the judge thou livest by cheating thy disciples rich people are like flowers clever men like thee are the bumblebees which unmindful of their homes continue to buzz over them every one is at last in death's power and yet men have departed without resigning the craving for wealth there are no bounds to this desire it is the only thing in this world that surviveth 
you shave the heads of some you send others to places of pilgrimages and at the same time ask for all they possess those thou seest wealthy thou entanglest in the narrow door and leviest a tax at so much per head on them thou then lettest them pass it is thirst for money not love of god that actuateth brahmans the brahman here o my daughter thou understandest not thou thinkest that he whom we call shiv is a stone all people bow their heads to brahmans and apply to their foreheads the water in which they have washed their feet the whole world worshippeth them while thou o foolish girl slanderest them this salagram is the primal and ancient brahm and is prized even by monarchs the princess here o foolish brahman thou knowest nothing thou recognizest a stone as the primal light of the world thou thinkest it holdeth the supreme being thou hast taken leave of thy senses deceive me not but take what thou desirest to take tell me not that a stone is god while telling fools so thou plunderest them to thy heart's content thou sendest men to rivers of pilgrimage to drown them in superstition thou makest unnumbered efforts to strip them of their wealth and not allow them to take a paisa home thou pretendest to find a number of inauspicious circumstances connected with a rich man so that he may give thee feasts to bribe thee to intercede for him when thou knowest that a man has spent all his wealth thou never lookest at him brahmans hover over money like ravens and quarrel like kites over a fish or dogs over a bone in public thou expoundest the veds but in thy heart is worship of money thou findest not god thy money soon departeth and vain is all thy service thou paradest thy learning but knowest not how to unite men with god thou callest thyself wise and me a fool what if thou o idiot eat not bong even still thou art not in thy senses everybody can see this for himself brave men taking bong fight and draw elephants teeth and grasping the scimitar and lance fearlessly smite their enemies say o tyrant what couldst thou do even wert thou to take bong thou wouldst even then if engaged in combat fall on thy face like a corpse through fright hear o brahman give instructions to fools save me from thy lies and preach thy falsehood to others why passest thou leather for metallic coin thou shalt go to terrible hell and be born again as a pariah hung up by the heels thou shalt be tortured in the house of death when thou and all thy relations are suffering what answer wilt thou make say what books wilt thou then read and wilt thou then worship the lingam wilt thou find shiv and krishan there where god will send thee bound where thou hast no son mother father or brother will ram come to thine assistance ever bow thy head to the great god whom the fourteen worlds fear whom all recognize as the creator and destroyer who hath no form or outline whose dwelling appearance and name are unknown by what name shall i speak of him since he cannot be spoken of he hath no father mother or brother no son or grandson unlike ram chandar or krishan he hath no male or female nurse he needeth no army to give him dignity what he saith is true and what he desireth he doeth some he regenerateth and others he consigneth to perdition he buildeth fashioneth createth and again destroyeth it is the great god i recognize as my guru i am his disciple and he is my priest i am a girl made by him o brahman i worship the great god a stone is not to my mind i call a stone a stone on this account people are displeased with me i call what is false false a matter which is disagreeable to all i tell the truth and pay no regard to any one as for thee o brahman art thou not ashamed of thy conduct fix thy thoughts even for a brief period on god the brahman 
god will consider him a sinner who saith that this stone is other than god and will cast into hell any one who useth profane language regarding it it is the primal and ancient god the princess i only worship the one great god i regard not shiv nor do i worship either brahma or vishnu i fear not your gods know that whoever invoketh them is already dead but death will not approach him who meditateth on the deathless one he who meditateth on the deathless one and even once invoketh his name shall obtain wealth and perfection in every act he who meditateth on the immortal god shall never suffer but enjoy great happiness in the world when death tortureth thee o brahman what book wilt thou then read will it be the bhagavad or the gita wilt thou hold on to ram or clutch at krishan for protection the gods whom thou deemest supreme have all been destroyed by death's mace none not even brahma vishnu or indar may escape it the gods were born as the demons were and both are subject to transmigration the hindus and the turks are the same and death is potent over them all sometimes the demons kill the gods and sometimes the gods the demons the being who destroyed both gods and demons is he who cherisheth me and whom i have taken as my guru i bow to him whose sovereignty is recognized in the fourteen worlds who destroyed indar vishnu the sun the moon kuvar varun and sheshnag the brahman shiv removeth all the sins of him who worshippeth this stone he who forsaketh this god and worshippeth another shall fall into hell he who giveth money to a brahman shall obtain tenfold in the next world he who giveth to other than a brahman shall derive no advantage therefrom the poet upon this the princess took the lingam in her hand struck the brahman with it and smashed all his teeth she then took away all the brahman's property the princess say now o brahman whither hath gone thy sheave he whom thou hast ever served hath broken thy teeth the idol which thou hast spent thy life in invoking hath at last entered thy mouth the poet all the property the princess took from the brahman she distributed among other brahmans and then said to her antagonist never mind thou shalt receive tenfold in the next world the princess thou sayest to others bestow your wealth or spend it thou who art so miserly that thou puttest not turmeric into the dal thou eatest thou art very deceitful and goest about for the purpose of deceit thou publicly plunderest people in the market-place thou spendest not a kauri and art ever begging calling girls thy daughters thou deflourest them thy mother was greed thy father avarice and thou art the incarnation of meanness while practising greed thou boastest of thy prodigality so that people may think thee a monarch thou art utterly worthless if any one knew the incantations thou pretendest to know he would not have to beg from door to door by repeating even once such an incantation as thou boastest of thou mightest fill thy house with wealth ram and krishan of whom thou speakest and those whom thou worshippest as shiv and brahma were all destroyed by death in due time god will again give them birth how many ram chandars and krishans how many brahmas shivs and vishnus the sun and moon what are these poor wretches simply water carriers at god's door they were created in due time and death shall destroy them all the vishnu who was cursed by jalandar's wife and became a stone thou callest a great god art thou not ashamed of thyself the brahman i will go to the raja thy father and have thee imprisoned the princess i will tell him a different story and have both thy hands cut off then shall i be really the king's daughter the brahman i will promise to do what thou tellest me provided thou dismiss thy wrath the princess worship not stones fall at the feet of the great god the poet then the brahman fell at the feet of the great god 
and threw his idols into the river by nand lal who was a famous sikh of guru gobind rai and wrote several works in the persian language on the sikh religion thus delivered himself in his jatbikas thousands of brahmas praise guru nanak for his glory exceedeth that of them all thousands of shivs and indars place themselves at his feet for his throne is more exalted than theirs thousands of vishnus many rams and krishans thousands of durgas and garaks sacrifice themselves at his feet by nand lal further on writes that as guru nanak so were all the gurus his successors including guru gobind rai it is therefore inferred that so far from guru gobind rai worshipping or doing homage to the goddess durga she was an insignificant entity who did homage to him End of section nine section ten of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter ten what is called the granth of the tenth guru is only partially his composition the greater portion of it was written by bards in his employ the two works entitled chandi charitar and the bhagauti ki war found in it are abridged translations by different hands of the durga sapt shati or seven hundred sloks on the subject of durga an episode in the markandaya poran on the contest of the goddess durga with the demons who had made war on the gods chandi charitar one the poet in the guru's employ who translated this states that he did it for amusement but adds the man who heareth or readeth this for any object shall assuredly obtain it this line is an abstract of the eleventh and twelfth sloks of the ninety-second canto of the original the translator then darkly refers to a special object of his own i have translated the book called the durga sapt shadi the equal of which there is none o chandi grant the object with which the poet has translated the translator's object however is not stated whether he imbibed some of the principles of sikhism or not from the guru cannot be ascertained but it is clear that he was largely tinctured with hinduism chandi charitar too at the end of this translation is found the couplet the saints who continually meditate on thee o chandi shall at last obtain salvation and find god as their reward this is not in the original sanskrit but the general sense may be inferred by a believer in chandi from her own self-glorification in the ninety-second canto the first chandi charitar begins as follows ek oam kar shri waguru ji ki fata ath chandi charitar ukt bilas now the tale bilas of the deeds of chandi will be told ukt the second chandi charitar begins in the same way but without the words ukt bilas the bhagauti ki war begins as follows ek om kar shri waguru ji ki fata sri bhagauti ji sahai war shri bhagauti ji ki pat shahi das there is one god victory to the holy waguru we implore the favour of the holy bhagauti sword the paean of the holy bhagauti of the tenth guru it thus appears that the bhagauti ki war was written by the tenth guru himself the hindus maintain that in the tenth guru's writings the word bhagauti means durga in the two chandi charitars the word bhagauti does not occur at all and even in the bhagauti ki war it is only found three times once in the title of the composition a second time in the first line and a third time elsewhere in the latter instance lay bhagauti durg shah it is clear that the word bhagauti means a sword the goddess durga took up the sword 
this is also attested by gurdas in the sixth powery of his twenty-fifth war he refers to the manner in which the signification of words is often altered and writes nam bhagauti lo garaya man hath fashioned what is called the sword bhagauti from iron in further proof that bhagauti does not mean durga in the sikh scriptures the following line in the ad granth is cited bhagauti mudra man mohaya maya the translation of which is men wear god's marks while their minds are fascinated with mammon the following are the first two paris of the war shri bhagauti ji ki having first remembered the sword meditate on guru nanak then on guru angad amar das and ram das may they assist me remember arjan har gobind and the holy hari rai meditate on the holy hari krishan a sight of whom dispelled all sorrows remember teg bahadur and the nine treasures shall come hastening to your homes ye holy gurus everywhere assist us god having first fashioned the sword created the whole world he created brahma vishnu and shiv and made them the sport of his omnipotence he made the seas and mountains of the earth and supported the firmament without pillars he made the demons and the demigods and excited dissension among them having created durga o god thou didst destroy the demons from thee alone ram received his power and slew rawan with his arrows from thee alone krishan received his power seized khans by the hair and dashed him on the ground very great munis and gods mortified their bodies for many ages but none of them found thy limit the last line of the bhagauti ki war is he who sang this was not born again that is he obtained deliverance this line gives the meaning of the twenty-second slok of the ninety-second canto of the markandaya puran the train of thought by which the guru made god and the sword one was as follows in the shastar namala is read i first mentioned the word shatru an enemy and then the word daman subduer know that the words compounded mean the lord of the world be assured of this the meaning is god subdues enemies so does the sword therefore the sword is god and god is the sword at that time it was the custom to recite on the eve of battle the praises and warlike deeds of the brave so that the hearts even of cowards might be inspired with eagerness for the fray on that account the tenth guru maintained fifty-two bards to translate the mahabharat the ramayan and the gallant achievements of ram krishan chandi and others it does not follow from this that the guru worshipped those whose acts were thus celebrated this was only done for the purpose of inciting to bravery dispelling cowardice and filling the hearts of his troops with valour to defend their faith this the guru himself declares in his translation of the tenth canto of the bhagavat in which are recounted the chivalrous exploits of krishan he says i have rendered in the vulgar dialect the tenth chapter of the bhagavat with no other object than to inspire ardour for religious warfare secondly the guru himself specially translated the praises of chandi so that they might be chanted for warlike purposes and that even cowards on hearing her story might obtain courage and the hearts of the brave beat with fourfold enthusiasm such being the achievements of a woman what ought not a brave man to accomplish the guru maintained that if a man became a coward and turned away from the battlefield he would not only become ashamed of himself but also forfeit his advantages here and hereafter in the third place the guru desired that his sikhs on becoming acquainted with the hindu sacred writings might be able to form their own estimate of them and their inferiority to the compositions of the gurus among the fifty-two bards employed by the guru there must have been several who had suffered for their religion under the persecutions of aurangzeb and for their opinions the guru cannot be held responsible End of section ten.
section eleven of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe guru gobind singh chapter eleven the guru directed all the masands to appear with their sikh constituents before him at anandpur at the basaki festival held about the middle of the month of april they collected large sums of money as a preparation for their journey half they kept for their own use and half they placed before the guru the guru then addressed them o oh, brother masands you have been the servants of the guru's house since the time of guru ram das you used formerly to collect large sums of money why have you brought so little this year for the support of the faith the masands replied o true guru the rich sikhs are all dead and we must take what we can obtain from the survivors the guru rejoined say not that my sikhs are poor i am going to make them all kings if you desire your welfare disgorge the offerings you have received from them the masands became angry and began to say among themselves the guru is of our own making did we not contribute the money necessary for his maintenance no one would call him a guru the masands left the guru's court and went to complain to bhai chetu the eldest member of their body who had survived since the days of guru ram das they represented to him that no guru had previously found fault with them but now guru gobind rai had threatened them with serious consequences jetu promised to speak to the guru on their behalf but at the same time reminded them that he was at the youthful age when men utter praise and blame without due discrimination chetu kept his promise and spoke to the guru on behalf of the masands true king the masands are all thy servants i beg thee to treat them with respect so that the sikhs may follow thy example the next time they come they will bring a larger amount of money for the supply of thy public kitchen the guru replied ask their brother sikhs here what language the masands have been using regarding me they have stolen the guru's money and deposited it in their own homes they are very proud they admit not the guru's power they have called my sikhs poor whereas i am daily advancing them and bestowing on them the sovereignty of the country and finally the masands are telling me falsehoods chetu begged the guru to pardon them the guru then said that chetu had countenanced them in embezzling the offerings and that he too deserved punishment like his fellows at this chetu began to storm and pretend innocence the guru was now thoroughly satisfied that the masands had arrived at a pass where they did not believe in any guru and that their insolence must be checked he therefore decided that as the human guruship must end with himself so must his sikhs be freed from the tyranny of the masands chetu went to the guru's mother and threatened that if the guru disowned the masands the sikhs would go in a body to dhir mal and the guru would be left without any means of support when the guru heard this he said be not anxious o mother my public kitchen belongeth to the immortal god and he will supply it with provisions it happened that at that time a man arrived at anandpur from chetu's district he had given chetu a set of bracelets made of rhinoceros hide as a present for the guru's mother when chetu was questioned he said he had duly given her the bracelets but it was satisfactorily proved that he had not and that he had been prevailed on by his wife to bestow them on her chetu was duly punished for his dishonesty the guru continued to receive many complaints against the masands one of them in particular billeted himself on a poor sikh and claimed sweets instead of the crushed pulse and unleavened bread which formed the staple food of his host the masand took the bread threw it into his host's face and dashed the crushed pulse on the ground he then began to abuse the sikh and would not cease until the poor man had sold his wife's petticoat to provide him with sweets 
when the guru was informed of this he set about punishing the masand he ordered that henceforth the sikhs should themselves present their offerings and that the employment of the masands for the purpose should cease one day a company of mimes went to perform before the guru he ordered them to imitate the masands one of them accordingly dressed as a masand two as a masand's servants and a fourth as a masand's courtesan riding behind him on horseback as he went to collect offerings for the guru the mimes portrayed to life the villainies and oppression practised by the masands the guru upon this finally resolved to free his sikhs from their tyranny he ordered that all the masands should be arraigned for their misdemeanours he listened in every case to their defences and explanations punished those whom he found guilty and pardoned those who succeeded in establishing their innocence among the latter was a masand called feru of whom mention has been made in the life of guru har rai feru lived in the country then called naka between the rivers ravi and bias the guru ordered that he should be brought before him the guru remembered an expression used by guru har rai to feru my purse is at thy disposal spend what thou pleasest from it guru gobind rai added the purse is thine and its disposal is also thine feru replied great king thine is the purse and thine also its disposal whether i am bad or good i am thine the guru knowing him to be without guile acquitted him and with his own hands invested him with a robe of honour some other masands too were acquitted as the result of feru's pleadings on their behalf once a company of udasis brought the guru a copy of the granth sahib written with great elegance for his attestation and signature at that time no granth was accepted as correct unless countersigned by the guru but petitioners had first to approach his minister diwan nan chand and submit the work to him for approval the latter observing the beautiful penmanship of the volume formed the dishonest intention of appropriating it he told the udasis to come in a month's time and he would meanwhile find some means of obtaining the guru's signature when they returned after the expiration of that period he told them he had not yet had an opportunity of speaking to the guru on the subject and suggested their waiting for another ten days by similar subterfuges he kept the udasis going backwards and forwards in suspense for six months at the end of that time he asked them to take the price of the granth sahib from him and prepare another for the guru's approval the udasis refused whereupon he had them forcibly expelled from anandpur one day when the guru went hunting the udasis found an opportunity of complaining to him of nan chand's conduct the guru at once ordered that their granth should be restored to them nan chand sent a message to the guru that he was ready to return the book but at the same time told the udasis to leave the place at once if they valued their safety if they made any further complaint to the guru they should be imprisoned and put to death the udasis were however not so easily deterred they bided their time to approach the guru on another occasion they complained that nan chand had disobeyed his order forcibly expelled them from the city and threatened them with death in the event of their return and making a further complaint against him the guru sent a severe message to nan chand evil days have come for thee as i treated the masands so shall i treat thee if thou desire thine own welfare restore their granth sahib to the udasas when the guru's message was communicated to nan chand he said go away i will not return the granth sahib see my friends how the guru seeketh to frighten me were i to shake the dust off the skirt of my coat i could make many gurus like him the sikhs replied very well let the guru come to thee and thou shalt see he will draw no distinction between thee and thy brother masands 
nand chand shrinking from the consequences of his temerity fled with the granth sahib to kartarpur when the guru heard that he had fled through fear of death he replied death will reach him there too when nand chand reached kartarpur he sent a message to dhir mal hundreds of thousands of sikhs adhere to thy cause they will all worship thee and make thee the guru of the world it is in my power to-day to raise thee to that eminence nand chand was however seriously distrusted at kartarpur it was suspected that he had come from the guru to practise some treachery either to kill dhir mal or take possession of the town dhir mal consulted his masands as to what was best to be done they advised that nand chand should be put to death according to the following stratagem as he came to pay a visit a musketeer should be hidden within the house to fire at him this was agreed on when nand chand entered dhir mal's ante-room he received a bullet in the thigh as he staggered the doors were closed to prevent his escape and he then received several fatal bullets from the roof which had been opened for the purpose one day the guru saw two horsemen pass his place and then make a diversion towards the satluj they were gurdas and his brother tara great-grandsons of bai bahilo and masands of ram rai who had come to seek the guru's protection but whose courage failed them at the last moment the guru caused them to be brought before him in reply to his messenger's questions they had said that they were bearers when they appeared before the guru he detected their disguise and asked why they had falsely represented themselves as bearers they told their history the guru on his visit on a former occasion to dara believing them to be trustworthy allowed them to remain there with punjab kaur ram rai's widow for her protection the other masands had poisoned punjab kaur's mind against them and they now fled to the guru for protection on arriving at anandpur they had heard of the guru's treatment of other masands and through fear turned aside to avoid him the guru complimented them as the descendants of bai bahilo on their finally confessing the truth to him and mentioned the respect in which bai bahilo had been held by the preceding gurus after their repentance the guru entertained them for some years and then allowed them to depart to their homes the guru always held the belief that it would be proper and advantageous to his sikhs to wear long hair and otherwise not alter man's god-given body and he often broached the subject to them on one occasion they replied that if they wore long hair they would be subjected to the banter and annoyance of both hindus and mohammedans the guru then suggested that they should wear arms and be at all times ready to defend themselves this advice was adopted in ancient times the guru said it was the universal custom to wear one's natural hair and he instanced the cases of ram chandar krishan christ and mohammed why should hair grow if god had meant it to be cut off a child's hair groweth in the womb the guru therefore hoped that his followers would never be guilty of the sin of shaving or cutting off their hair and those who obeyed his injunctions he promised to consider true members of his faith it is recorded that at this time the sikhs lived in great social love and harmony they regarded themselves as brothers they used to feed one another shampoo one another when tired bathe one another wash one another's clothes and one sikh always met another with a smile on his face and love in his heart a company of sikhs came to visit the guru and made the following representation we have found it very difficult to approach thee on account of the violence of the mohammedans some of our company have been killed by them on the way others have been wounded and have returned to their homes to whom can we look for assistance but to thee the guru on hearing this remained silent and reflected that the tyranny of the turks had certainly become 
intolerable and that all religion was being banished from the land the guru invited all his sikhs to attend the great baisakhi fair at anandpur without shaving or cutting their hair on finding them assembled he ordered that carpets should be spread on a raised mound which he indicated and that an adjacent spot should be screened off with kanats or tent walls when this was done the guru ordered a confidential sikh to go at midnight tie five goats in the enclosure and let no one know what he had done the goats were duly tied and separate orders were given to the guru's orderlies not to go within the tent walls next morning the guru rose a watch before day performed his devotions and put on arms and uniform he then proclaimed that there should be a great open-air gathering when all were seated he drew his sword and asked if there was any one of his beloved sikhs ready to lay down his life for him no reply was given all grew pale on hearing such a proposal the guru asked a second time but with the same result a third time he spoke in a louder voice if there be any true sikh of mine let him give me his head as an offering and proof of his faith daya ram a sikh of lahore rose and said o true king my head is at thy service the guru took his arm led him within the enclosure and gave him a seat he then cut off a goat's head with one stroke of the sword went forth and showed the dripping weapon to the multitude the guru again asked is there any other true sikh who will bestow his head on me the crowd felt now quite convinced that the guru was in earnest and that he had killed daya ram so no one replied at the third time of asking dharm das of dili answered o great king take my head the guru assuming an angry mien took dharm das within the enclosure seated him near daya ram and killed another goat the guru then looking very fierce came forth and said is there any other sikh who will offer me his head i am in great need of sikhs heads on this some remarked that the guru had lost his reason others went to the guru's mother to complain and said that he had undergone a complete change and was no longer responsible for his actions they instanced his sacrificing two sikhs with apparently no object his mother was advised to depose him and confer the guruship on his eldest son she sent a messenger for him but he was too intent on his own purpose at the time to receive messengers of any description he called out for a third sikh ready to offer him his life whereupon muhakam chand of daraka offered himself as a sacrifice upon this the guru handed him into the enclosure and killed a third goat he then came forth showing his dripping sword as before when the guru called out for a fourth sikh for sacrifice the sikhs began to think that he was going to kill them all some ran away and many hung down their heads sahib chand a resident of bidar clasped his hands in an attitude of supplication and said he placed his head at the guru's disposal the guru took him behind the tent walls and killed a fourth goat when he came forth as before he asked for a fifth sikh who was prepared to lay down his life for him on this there was a general flight of the remaining sikhs and only those who were very staunch in their faith ventured to stay himat of jagarnath answered the guru's last call and said he might take his life also the guru then took him inside the enclosure and killed the remaining goat the guru was now ready to sacrifice his own life for the five sikhs who showed such devotion to him he clad them in splendid raiment so that they shone like the sun and thus addressed them my brethren you are in my form and i am in yours he who thinketh there is any difference between us erreth exceedingly then seating the five sikhs near him he proclaimed to the whole assembly in the time of guru nanak there was found one devout sikh namely guru angad in my time there are found five sikhs totally devoted to the guru 
these shall lay anew the foundation of sikhism and the true religion shall become current and famous through the world these people became astonished at the guru's expedient and fell at the feet of the five devoted sikhs saying hail to the sikh religion you brethren have established it on a permanent basis had we offered our heads like you we too should be blessed the guru again addressed his sikhs since the time of baba nanak charan pahal hath been customary men drank the water in which the gurus had washed their feet a custom which led to great humility but the khalsa can now only be maintained as a nation by bravery and skill in arms therefore i now institute the custom of baptism by water stirred with a dagger and change my followers from sikhs to singhs or lions they who accept the nectar of the pahul shall be changed before your very eyes from jackals into lions and shall obtain empire in this world and bliss hereafter according to the persian historian gulam muhai ul din the news writer of the period sent the emperor a copy of the guru's address to his sikhs on that occasion it is dated the first of baisakh sambat seventeen fifty six a d sixteen ninety nine and is as follows let all embrace one creed and obliterate differences of religion let the four hindu castes who have different rules for their guidance abandon them all adopt the one form of adoration and become brothers let no one deem himself superior to another let none pay heed to the ganges or other places of pilgrimage which are spoken of with reverence in the shastars or adore incarnations such as ram krishan brahma and durga but believe in guru nanak and the other sikh gurus let men of the four castes receive my baptism eat out of one dish and feel no disgust or contempt for one another the news-writer when forwarding this proclamation to his master submitted his own report when the guru had thus addressed the crowd several brahmans and khatris stood up and said that they accepted the religion of guru nanak and of the other gurus others on the contrary said that they would never accept any religion which was opposed to the teaching of the veds and the shastars and that they would not renounce at the bidding of a boy the ancient faith which had descended to them from their ancestors thus though several refused to accept the guru's religion about twenty thousand men stood up and promised to obey him as they had the fullest faith in his divine mission the guru caused his five faithful sikhs to stand up he put pure water into an iron vessel and stirred it with a khanda or two-edged sword he then repeated over it the sacred verses which he had appointed for the ceremony namely the japji the japji guru amar das's anand and certain sarwayas or quatrains of his own composition the guru in order to show his sikhs the potency of the baptismal nectar which he had prepared put some of it aside for birds to drink upon this two sparrows came and filled their beaks with it then flying away they began to fight the chronicler states like two rajas struggling for supremacy and died by mutual slaughter the inference was that all animals which drank the guru's baptismal water should become powerful and warlike bhai ram kaur a descendant of bhai buddha went and told the guru's wife mata jito that he was inaugurating a new form of baptism he also gave her an account of the incident of the sparrows mata jito taking some indian sweetmeats called patasha went out of curiosity to the guru he said she had come at an opportune moment and asked her to throw the sweets into the holy water he had begun he said to beget the khalsa as his sons and without a woman no son could be produced now that the sweets were poured into the nectar the sikhs would be at peace with one another otherwise they would be at continual variance the five sikhs fully dressed and accoutred stood up before the guru he told them to repeat waguru and the preamble of the japji 
he then gave them five palmfuls of the amrit to drink he sprinkled it five times on their hair and their eyes and caused them all to repeat waguru ji ka khalsa waguru ji ki fata on this he gave them all the appellation of singhs or lions he then explained to them what they might and what they might not do they must always wear the following articles whose names begin with a k namely kes long hair kanga a comb kripan a sword kak short drawers kara a steel bracelet they were enjoined to practise arms and not show their backs to the foe in battle they were ever to help the poor and protect those who sought their protection they must not look with lust on another's wife or commit fornication but adhere to their wedded spouses they were to consider their previous castes erased and deem themselves all brothers of one family sikhs were freely to intermarry among one another but must have no social or matrimonial relations with smokers with persons who kill their daughters with the descendants or followers of prithi chand dhir mal ram rai or masands who had fallen away from the tenets and principles of guru nanak they must not worship idols cemeteries or cremation grounds they must only believe in the immortal god they must rise at dawn bathe read the prescribed hymns of the gurus meditate on the creator abstain from the flesh of an animal whose throat had been jagged with a knife in the mohammedan fashion and be loyal to their masters when the guru had thus administered baptism to his five tried sikhs he stood up before them with clasped hands and begged them to administer baptism to himself in precisely the same way as he had administered it to them they were astonished at such a proposal and represented their own unworthiness and the greatness of the guru whom they deemed god's vicar upon earth they asked why he made such a request and why he stood in a suppliant posture before them he replied i am the son of the immortal god it is by his order i have been born and have established this form of baptism they who accept it shall henceforth be known as the khalsa the khalsa is the guru and the guru is the khalsa there is no difference between you and me as guru nanak seated guru angad on the throne so have i made you also a guru wherefore administer the baptismal nectar to me without any hesitation accordingly the five sikhs baptized the guru with the same ceremonies and injunctions he himself had employed he thus invested his sect with the dignity of gurudom the guru called the five sikhs who had baptized him his panch payare or five beloved and himself gobind singh instead of gobind rai the name by which he had been previously known upon this many others prepared to receive baptism the first five to do so after the beloved of the guru were ram singh deva singh tahil singh ishar singh and fatah singh these were named the panch mukta or the five who had obtained deliverance after them many thousands were baptized a supplementary ordinance was now issued that if any one cut his hair smoked tobacco associated with a mohammedan woman or ate the flesh of an animal whose throat had been jagged with a knife he must be rebaptized pay a fine and promise not to offend any more otherwise he must be held to be excommunicated from the khalsa the place where the guru administered his first baptism is now known as kesgar the sikh chronicler by santok singh has composed the following on this memorable event god's khalsa which arose is very holy when its followers meet they say wa guru ji ki fatah the khalsa hath abolished regard for pyres spiritual rulers and miracle workers of other sects whether hindu or mussulman the world on seeing a third religion was astonished enemies apprehended that it would deprive them of sovereignty the guru inaugurated a new custom for the establishment of the faith the effacement of sin and the repetition of god's name End of chapter eleven